Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, turning up. Uh, I'm Bill Sylvester and uh, Charlie Cork, and I have uh, great pleasure in uh, running this workshop with you. Uh, we've seen the delegate list, and I understand that most of you are nursing staff, um, and we've got a few people from overseas, and we've got one or two um, ANZIX doctors uh, in the room. And I think we had registration for 70 people. So from my quick count a few minutes ago, I think we've got about 40. So we just need to be aware that maybe a few people are going to be coming in at a later stage, or maybe they've realised that the sunshine's much more fun than being in here with us. Um, I'm the chair of the ANZIX End of Life Care Working Group, as well as the Death and Organ Donation Committee. And I'm the immediate past president of the International Society of Advanced Care Planning and End of Life Care. I'm not sure if any of you have previously attended our two international conferences we've held in Melbourne um, previously. Um, and Charlie Cork, um, his main claim to fame, apart from being a, uh, the director of the ICU at Geelong Hospital for many years, is uh, currently the president of the College of Intensive Care Medicine. Is there anything else I left off that slide, Charlie? You want? All right, so we're going to be talking about um, end-of-life issues and advanced care planning. Um, we're going to be covering the legalities, the ethics, communication aspects, and uh, later on in this session, which is going to have a morning tea break, we're also going to be doing some uh, role plays so that you all gain practical experience about have, how to have these sort of discussions. The first thing I want to really get across to you is how important this is to the work that we do and how relevant it is. Here was a fantastic study. It was only published in 2011, where they, uh, 2012, sorry, where they looked at um, 10, 000, more than 10,000 inpatients in 25 Scottish teaching hospitals in March 2010. And really the, what they wanted to do is look at the, the likelihood or the imminence of death simply because you've been admitted to hospital. And what was amazing about this is, as you know, the best studies are always the simplest studies. All they did is document every patient that was admitted to these hospitals on a particular day and then followed what happened to them for the next 12 months. And the first thing that I found most shocking with this was that 29% of all these patients died within 12 months. Now, these are just as good as hospitals uh, they have in Scotland as anywhere else. So that's, uh, that's really a wake-up call for all of us when we're looking after any patients in hospital. But the juicy bit is on this graph here. This shows that males aged 75 or over had a 50% chance of dying within the next 12 months. And amongst the females of the same age group, 40% of them were dead within 12 months. So if we think about whether it's relevant to talk about end-of-life issues, and from my perspective about advanced care planning, in other words, talking to people about if they got so sick, what would they want done to them, it's completely relevant to every patient that comes into hospital. And particularly relevant to those people who have reached a certain age. Now, this is Scottish data. What about Australian data? Well, here's a study that was published in 2009 by Sean Bagshaw, looking at ANZIC's database. And this showed that 13% of all the ICU admissions were people over the age of 80. And not surprisingly, these people over the age of 80 were more likely to come from an aged care facility, have greater comorbid illness, greater illness severity, and were more likely not to receive mechanical ventilation when they were admitted to the ICU. And all that makes sense. And here's the result. 24% of these people died in hospital for that admission to the ICU versus 13% for the overall ANZICS database at the same period. And particularly for the elderly, those over the age of 80, who spent seven or more days in ICU, 40% of them were going to die in hospital. So what I would encourage you to do is start to think about the patients you look after when you go back from this conference and think anyone is at risk of dying if they've been admitted to hospital. It's even greater if they've been admitted to ICU. There's some seats up the front if you want to come through. And 
even more likely if you're aged over the age of 80, and even more likely if you're aged over the 80 and you've already been in ICU for seven days. So wouldn't it make sense for us to already be starting to think about talking to these patients and talking to their family about end of life issues, given the likelihood? And given that information, isn't it amazing how like little we actually do about it? So again, here's data from the ANZICS database, 2015. This data is up to date as of last night, um, uh, with David Pilcher sending me this data, that on admission, only 5% of patients admitted to our ICUs across Australia and New Zealand have a treatment limitation of any sort. 0.3% of them are admitted for palliative care and 0.1% are admitted specifically for organ donation. You know those cases that come up from ED, we know there's nothing else we can do for them, but they've been brought up specifically for organ donation. Whether it's been discussed with the family or not, I don't know, but that's the evidence. So you can see that's a very small percentage. And it really shows there's a disconnect between what's actually happening in the ICU and how we as intensive care doctors and nurses are actually managing it. So let me show you a case that really brings it home as to what this is all about. This is an elderly man brought in from a nursing home by ambulance. As you can see, he's uh, hypoxic, he's got nasal prongs on. So this is a real picture of a patient taken by his son. I've got permission to use this picture. And as I'm sure you can imagine from this picture, this man has advanced dementia. So for some time he's been bed bound, doubly incontinent, doesn't recognise anyone or anything, been kept alive in a nursing home, and he comes in with pneumonia. And you can imagine the scenario, down in ED we have two choices. We can either go through, we can stick the drip in, take blood cultures, start antibiotics, do everything, send him up to the ward when he deteriorates, it's a met call or a code blue, he ends up in ICU ventilated, and eventually recovers enough, you know, obviously you'd know that that would be very distressing throughout that period for him. And he gets back to the ward, slowly recovers, and then gets back to the nursing home. Ah, oh, still severely demented, doubly incontinent, bed bound, not recognising anyone or anything. Or we could sit down as doctors and nurses and have a talk to that family and say, what would your dad want at this time? Or we can use terms like pneumonia is the old man's best friend or let's allow a natural course, let's allow a natural death, and particularly sitting down and saying, what do you think your dad would want at this time? Not what do you want, because then you get all the people who feel guilty and, oh, I don't know, we never talked about it, my brother's really wanting us to do everything, maybe we should ask for everything to be done. No, it's not about that, it's not about what you want, what would your mum or what would your dad want at a time like this? And we're going to be touching on that more later, but I'm just giving you the essence of it at this moment. But why don't we do it? We don't do it because it requires skill, it requires practice, we feel uncomfortable. And so it's so much easier for the medical registrar and the down in the ED say, yep, please send to ICU and ICU accept the patient over the phone, ordering the tests rather than sitting down and spending that time with the family. What a difference it's going to make to this guy about whether what we're doing is what he would want or whether we go through the motions. Now, when I show this slide to people or when I've done end-of-life stuff and advanced care planning stuff for the last decade or so, how many times have I had family or the public or even doctors and nurses saying, but, you know, you're a doctor, you've signed that Hippocratic Oath. Don't you have to do everything no matter what? So I got really interested in that because I, I knew that Intuitively, that's not the case, but I really wanted to look at this business about the Hippocratic Oath. So I tried to go back to a source document. Now, I don't know about you, I struggled with this particular interpretation of the 12th century Byzantine version. So I went to a more recent interpretation, and as you can see, the Hippocratic Oath was where, really where we said, well, I swear by Apollo the Healer, you could replace Tony Abbott or... Donald Trump or something like that. I'll prescribe regimens for the good of my patients according to my ability and my judgment. 
and never do harm to anyone. So it's about beneficence, doing good, and non-maleficence, not doing harm. And you hear people say, you know, our role as doctors and nurses is first do no harm. And that's really what we want to emphasise today with what we think about what we're doing in intensive care. First do no harm. And if you want to look at it in more legal parlance, this is from Professor Lone Skeen, University of Melbourne, Professor of uh, Health Law. What's our duty of care as a doctor or a nurse? And it's to take reasonable steps. And what that means, I've got in parenthesis here, as other reasonable doctors or nurses would. And what that means is if I got challenged, if I got sued by family or anyone else, I ended up in court, what do I do? I have expert witnesses. I have my lawyers help me have line up Charlie Cork and others, my colleagues, my peers, who will attest to the fact what I was doing was within good medical practice, or in your case, within good nursing practice. So, to take reasonable steps to save or prolong life or act in the patient's best interests. So, if you think back to the previous slide, sure, we could do all those things to that patient, but would we be acting in his best interests? And I would put to you that we're not if we go and do all those things. What we're doing, if we're acting in his best interests, is to spend that time sitting down talking to the patient, not in his case, or the family, and really thinking about it. And I would suggest to you that this is what we should be doing much more of in terms of the patients we're admitting to the ICU. Come in, please. There is a table up the front. Oops, I scared them away. That wasn't the intention, I promise. <laughs> um, so this is what we should be thinking about, not only about the sort of patients we're admitting to the ICU, but also what we're doing once they're in and also what we're doing once we discharge them. And hands up, who's seen a case where they came in, we really questioned about whether they should be there, but at least we got them out of the ICU no one talked about it, what was to happen next, and then they turned up, readmitted to the ICU and died in the ICU. I've certainly seen it many times. Right. And in fact, it was just last night, Charlie and I were talking, oh, yesterday afternoon, talking about the number of cases that we've seen like this. And indeed, if we were medical administrators, we'd probably close half the ICU beds in terms of really assessing how much good we're doing. OK, so it's about duty of care and acting in people's best interests. And the best way of ensuring we're acting in someone's best interests is to talk to them while they still have capacity about what they would want. And that's where advanced care planning comes in. So I'm going to touch advanced care planning now and sort of get it out of the way, but in a way raise it so you recognise that if we're talking in this workshop about end of life stuff, whether we're talking about end of life stuff for someone who's dying today or tomorrow, or we're talking about end-of-life stuff for someone who may get admitted to hospital or ICU in 12 months' time, which we call advanced care planning, it's a seamless, it's, a, it's, it's all the same stuff. It's about talking to people about their needs, their desires, what we can offer them, and always thinking about how can we act in this person's best interests. So, you know, if I was giving this talk five years ago or ten years ago, most people, if I asked them to put their hand up, so they know what advanced care planning is. Many people would not put their hand up. But now it's become much more prominent because of the work we've been doing. We've now got political support. It's now on the agenda for ACHS. As you know, it's now into the accreditation guidelines. It's getting out there into primary care. We've still got a long way to go, but it's started. And as you can see, the definition is a process of planning for future health and personal care whereby the person's values and preferences are made known so they can guide decision-making at a future time when the person cannot make or communicate their decisions. And that's the definition from the National Framework for Advanced Care Directives done by the Australian Health Minister's Advisory Council Working Party and published in 2011. And the ethical principles underscoring this are those of autonomy, particularly around informed consent, and dignity, particularly around the prevention of suffering. <coughs> I might just stop for a moment. For those of you who are interested in these slides, um, I'm very happy to share them later, so let me know. And the reason I'm saying that is, instead of spending time trying to write everything down, 
if that frees you up to the listen and maybe make notes that you can incorporate later, go for it. So what are the benefits of advanced care planning? And I've really only got one slide on this. We could really spend the two hours on this. But it's about the fact that it improves end-of-life care and it improves patient satisfaction. And we've pro shown this in our BMJ study published in 2010, that simply having a trained nurse sit down and talk to a patient, how are you going, what's going on, what do you want us to do, what are your goals and values? You know, obviously I'm concertining that conversation. They appreciate the fact that someone's bothered to sit down and talk to them. And so when they fill out a form saying their overall sense of satisfaction about their care during that admission, it goes up significantly. It empowers the patient now, not just in the future. So people think advanced care planning is talking about the future, but the fact you're sitting down asking them what do they want, they start to say things like, well, actually, do I have to have that procedure that's planned for tomorrow? Do I have to have the tracheostomy? Do I have to go on to dialysis? Do I have to have that tube? Do I have to have that operation? Advanced care planning also assists the family to know the patient's wishes and be involved in the discussions. It means that they're more able to make the decisions because the family aren't making the burdensome decision when the doctors come to them saying, what do you want us to do? They don't think, oh my God, we never talked about it. You know, what would mum want? We better say go for everything or they feel burdened by the decision or they get caught up in their religious views. This way, they make the decision because they know what mum or dad want. They feel less burdened and as a result of that, the relatives feel less, have less stress and anxiety and depression. And that was shown in our study that was published where we interviewed the relatives of the people who died three months after the death and there was a statistically significant difference in the likelihood of stress, anxiety, and depression. And when I talk stress, I'm talking about post-traumatic stress symptoms. So three months down the track, they were less likely to be waking up in the middle of the night thinking about what an awful death mum had. They're less likely to be waking up in the middle of the night or having trouble going to sleep or thinking about it during the day, having thought penetration, the whole lot. Now, what a winner. I mean, we really did the study to see if we could improve patient care. But we had this fantastic gilding of the lily where we had a positive impact on the family members as well. And we found that the relatives were more satisfied with the quality of the patient's death, not only because they saw that mum didn't suffer because we avoided her having that operation that she didn't want, but also because the families played an active role in looking after mum. So they didn't feel like passive observers sitting back thinking, oh, this is, this is all out of control and feeling like they couldn't have a role to becoming actively involved, A, because they'd been encouraged to do so and B, because they knew what mum did or didn't want. Now, what's the law around advanced care planning? There are laws right across Australia, statutory laws in every state and territory apart from New South Wales. There aren't any statutory laws in New Zealand and there's none in New South Wales. But there's been an su important Supreme Court case in New South Wales that has elevated the role of advanced care planning even in that state. So what was the case? It happened at, uh, at uh, John Hunter Hospital in Newcastle. A guy, Mr A, had previously prepared an advanced care directive where he refused life-sustaining treatment. He was subsequently admitted urgently and placed on dialysis as an emergency. I think his potassium was you know, through the roof, seven something. Then they found that he had an advanced care directive where he refused dialysis, amongst other things. <coughs> so the proposal was to take him off dialysis, but they knew he'd die, and the health service was concerned they might then get charged with murder. So they asked for a Supreme Court declaration to comply with the advanced care directive. And the Supreme Court said a number of things. Firstly, they said, if the advanced care directive is made, is made by a capable adult and is clear and unambiguous and extends to the situation at hand, then it must be respected. Hallelujah. At last, we actually had a court case saying, you can't ignore these anymore. You can't have doctors and nurses choosing to say, oh, that's just something written on a bit of paper. I choose to ignore it. It's against the law now. 
Secondly, it would be battery to administer medical treatment to a person of the kind prohibited by a valid advanced care directive. Thirdly, a refusal treatment didn't need to be an informed refusal, i.e. based on medical information. It's valid whether based on religious, social or moral grounds or even upon no, uh, no apparent rational grounds. Now that is, you know, sometimes you read Supreme Court cases and it's just brilliant because you get clever lawyers, clever judges who really think through things and they cut to the chase. And the great thing about that is this. That if you, say one of you had a lump, you went to see your GP, had some tests and you found out you got cancer, right? GP says, I'm going to refer you off to a surgeon, you've got stomach cancer and we're going to do a partial or full gastrectomy, chemo and radiotherapy. And you, say, you think to yourself, actually, John down the road, he died of that about two years ago and he had an awful time. He spent three months in hospital, he had all the complications of the world, his hair fell out, he never stopped vomiting, if you can still vomit when you got a gastrectomy. He was really sick and then he just died after an awful six months. No, I'm not going to do any of that. I want to go off to Antarctica for a trip. And you say that to the GP. Well, the GP can't tie you to the chair and say, no, you've got to sit here and listen to all this. I'm not happy with your decision. So you as a human being can make any decision you want as long as you're competent to do so. And you can choose to have as much or as little information as you want. Now, it's our role as health professionals, doctors and nurses, to attempt to inform a patient as much as we can, but we can't force them to sit there and listen. You can't say, well, you have to listen to the following words before I'll accept that you've given informed consent. You can say, get stuffed. See you later. I'm out of here. And the law supports that. It doesn't have to actually be based on any rational grounds, or it could be based because you're a J JW. You don't want a blood transfusion. You can't say, I deem you as incompetent because you're saying no to a blood transfusion because of some stupid religious reason. So why, if that's the case, shouldn't this apply to advanced care planning? A few years ago, when I was at the Austin Hospital, we had a case where the vascular surgeons had a young person with diabetes who had a gangrenous leg. And they went to consent her to do a, a, um, a, an amputation. And she said, no, I'd rather die with two legs than survive with one. So what did they do? They then consulted the psychiatrist to try and deem her as incompetent. <laughs> you can't have it both ways. You can't go and get consent, and if they don't agree with you, to then say, well, actually, we deem you incompetent to even give consent in the first place. So I know I've harped on this, but I just think this is brilliant because it really says to us, our role is to try and inform them as much as they wish to be informed. And then if they make a decision, we have to back them on their decision. And then the last thing is, even in an emergency, you cannot treat contrary to a known advanced care directive. So you can't always say, well, to save life or limb, we can just go ahead and treat regardless. So I'm not going to cover anything more on the statutory advanced care planning legislation in each state or territory because it varies across the board. I'm happy to talk to you during the break or later or send you anything, but you're most welcome to look it up on your own um, websites in each of your state and territories. So the next point is, what are the key elements of an advanced care planning discussion? And you'll see that there's similarities in this to the end of life discussions that Charlie and I are going to be talking to you about later. Firstly, does the patient understand their illness and current treatment? There's some chairs up the front here if you want to come through. Secondly, what is important to them in their lives? What gives them meaning? In other words, what are their values? And Charlie's going to touch on this later. Thirdly, does their illness limit what they can do and in what way? So think of a patient with emphysema who's bed, not bed bound, but home bound, oxygen dependent. And if you go and admit them to the ICU for treatment of their pneumonia, are you going to be delivering them to back to an even worse state than they were before? Fourthly, if they became seriously ill and couldn't communicate, who would they want the doctors to talk to about what to do? In other words, who's going to be their substitute decision maker? 
And it's pretty straightforward. I go and talk to a patient. I say, it's great, Mrs Jones, to see you're getting better from the pneumonia. And we're looking forward to you to being discharged from hospital soon. If you got sick again and we couldn't talk to you, who would you want us to talk to? I haven't had to mention a medical enduring power of attorney or an enduring guardian or any fancy words. I haven't had to mention substitute decision maker. I've said to them, who would you want us to talk to? And they'll immediately say, oh, look, I'd really want you to talk to my daughter, Joan. I've been living with her for the last three years. She knows my views on all this sort of thing. And you say, that's great. Would you like us to help you put this in writing? And she said, because if you put it in writing, then we can make sure that anyone who comes to talk, talks to Joan. And she said, that'd be great, because I'm so worried that her bossy brother from Brisbane will bowl up and say, I want you to do everything, because the last time we talked, we had an argument. You can all imagine the scenario. And then the last point is, if you became seriously ill and we couldn't talk to you and we couldn't get hold of your daughter, Joan, what sort of things would you want or not want? And it's not about if you got this condition, do you want that? If you want that condition, do you want this thing? Because they don't know what dialysis means or haemofiltration. They don't know what CPR means apart from what, the, what they've watched on ER and Chicago Hope. So it's more about... What would be your line in the sand? What would be an acceptable outcome? And so then, once you know what's an acceptable outcome, then you as the doctors and nurses can think about what they've said is an acceptable outcome, marry that up with what their condition and prognosis and treatment options are, and then work out what's in their best interest and talk to them if they're still um, able to discuss it or to their family. So you might find that they say, if I can't walk or talk or eat or feed myself or recognise my family, I don't want anything. And they've turned up with a dominant hemisphere stroke and they're not going to move their right leg again and they're not going to be able to speak. And I had a great case a few years ago where within 12 months of having dealt with a dialysis patient who said exactly these things, he turned up with a stroke. And his wife was really struggling to let things go, as was the nephrologist and the neurologist. We pulled out his advanced care directive. We said, he actually said we didn't, he didn't want any of this. And the neurologist said he, had already said he wasn't going to recover. So we ended up keeping him comfortable and he died several days later off dialysis instead of ending up with a peg tube being brought in by ambulance from the nursing home three times a week for dialysis, which is exactly what would have happened according to the nephrologist if we proceeded with treatment. So you can see in a practical way what a difference this really makes. And lastly, you don't need to mention CPR. I don't talk to people about CPR anymore because as I say, they think about ER and Chicago Hope where the study published in the New England Journal showed there was an 80% success rate with CPR in all those TV shows. And in fact, and you guys will understand this better than anyone, not only did they have an 80% success rate, but most of them had a full neurological recovery and they were sitting up eating a sandwich before your next ad break. <laughs> Whereas we know the reality is less than 20% survive and many of them will end up with significant neurological impairment. So it drives me crazy when I've, and I've heard it many times, I'm sure you have, where an intern or a resident or a registrar goes up to a family and says, if your mum's heart stops, do you want us to jump on a chest? And of course, what the family hear is, do you love your mum? And of course, they're going to say, yes, please do everything. But the subtext there is, please do everything that's going to help mum. But the intern hears, please do everything, and tears up the not for resuscitation form they've just filled out. And then they end up in ICU. It's just crazy. So don't ask crazy questions. You know, that pneumonia patient, I said, oh, Mrs Jones, I'm so pleased to see you getting better. And if you were to get unwell, you know, we, who would we talk to? And she says, Joan. And I say, and by the way, because we know you've got some heart failure, and remember that echo, that ultrasound of your heart showed that your heart's not working very well now and you, that valve inside, that mitral valve, it's very leaky and your kidneys are not working so well. Just wanted to let you know that if you got so sick, if you got so sick that your heart was to stop. What I'd be doing is calling your family 
and letting them know that we're keeping you comfortable. Is that okay with you? Now, I've said that hundreds of times. I'm still waiting for the first patient to say that they disagree. If you explain it in a caring, compassionate way. But if I was to go to her and say, and if your heart stops, would you want us to try and start again? She thinks, oh, yeah, of course, doctor. You know, it's all about how we phrase things. Okay. So we've talked about that. So I'm just going to go through these things about medical decision making, then I'll be handing over to Charlie. <clears throat> Remember the ethical principles about medical decision making are based on my body, my choice, or no decision about me without me. You wouldn't operate on someone without getting their consent. Why should we be doing other things without consent? About doing good and about not doing harm. So medical decision making should always be based on the best interest test. Is the proposed medical treatment medically indicated? And if we think about the condition, the prognosis, the acceptable outcome, and we think about the benefits and the burdens, and remember that we're not obliged to provide or continue any treatment that's either futile or not in the patient's best interest, even if the patient or the family request it. So if a patient came to you as a, a thoracic surgeon who's got emphysema, not the surgeon, the patient, and they're at risk of being oxygen dependent and they've got a shadow on the lung, no thoracic surgeon worth their salt is going to do a pneumonectomy to remove that if they then leave them short of breath and more oxygen dependent. If they did, they'd actually get challenged. So that's just one example. Same as a cardiac surgeon's not, not going to, or shouldn't, <laughs> operate on as someone who's not going to benefit from having that valve replacement at the age of 85. Oh, I wish that wasn't the case. <laughs> Particularly in private. <laughs> anyway, um, so as doctors and nurses, we should be working out what's in someone's best interest and then offering that. And then based on what we offer, it's then up to the patient to decide if that's what they want once they're informed as much as they want to be or the substitute decision maker on behalf of the non competent patient. In other words, I'm the doctor. This is my role. I am offering <laughs> vanilla, chocolate and strawberry. Banana is not on the menu. And then the patient or the family are over here saying, actually, Dad always liked chocolate. We're going for that. We'll avoid the others. But we're not asking for vanilla. Oh, sorry, we're not asking for banana because the doctor hasn't even presented it. And in fact, if we've heard about banana and we raise it, the doctor will say, that wouldn't be in your dad's best interest. We're only offering chocolate, vanilla or strawberry. And that's where the shared decision-making comes up because in the process of talking about that, we either don't bring up banana or if we bring it up, we bring it up to exclude it or indicate why it wouldn't be on the menu. And remember, that unwanted medical interventions can be refused by the patient even if death is the likely outcome. So there are two points where things are not on offer. Either the doctor doesn't offer it because it's not indicated or the patient refuses it even if the doctor thinks it's indicated or is offering it. So uh, that side is out of sequence. We've already covered that. We've covered that. <coughs> so who can give consent? If the patient has decision-making capacity, they're the ones who give consent, and that's based on these things. And I'll just go through it very quickly, but people get caught up about this whole thing about is the patient competent? And I point out every time a doctor or a nurse goes and gets a patient to sign a consent form or consents to having something done, we're assessing their competence at that moment. You already know where they are orienti orientated in time and place. You already know whether you may have done a, a, uh, a mini mental and asked them if they know who the Prime Minister is, although that's not always easy to tell these days. But do they understand the information you're presenting? Do they appreciate the relevance to their current situation? Can they reason about it by actually asking you questions, what are the alternatives, weighing up the risks and benefits, and can they express a choice and the rationale for it? Remembering, of course, if they don't want to express the rationale, they don't have to. And then for the non-competent patient, you identify the substitute decision maker and you go through the same process 
but focusing on what would the patient want. Because remember, if you're making a substitute decision, you're making it on behalf of them, not on behalf of you as a relative. And the decision making is guided by an advanced care plan if it's been written, or even if it's just an expression of what mum or dad said they did or didn't want when they last watched 60 Minutes where there was a presentation of a patient who had an awful outcome. And always by consideration of what's in the person's best interests. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Charlie. Um, now, I don't know whether you want to do this or go to your value stuff or... Okay. So we're just going to... Yep, sure. And if you want to just take that slide down, Gerald, or do I need to do it here? All right. If you could do it and then just bring up Charlie's stuff. <coughs> Sorry. Can we just grab the microphone? The reason why I'm just grabbing the microphone is because this session's been recorded, so it's the only way to make sure that... Sorry? Oh, okay. Sure, okay. I'll, I'll repeat the question so it's recorded. Yep. Before you get to that tipping point where they're, you have this major decision about an ICU admission. And I think, I do feel that it should be a clear thing that the parents and the patient should be a bit more involved in than they are. So, in summary, the question stroke comment is who should be the best person to be having the discussion with the family or patient about limitation of treatment and how frustrating it is as ICU doctors and nurses that self and the parent doctors and the parent nurses have not had this discussion with the patient or family. And we as the intensivists end up being the gatekeepers and being left to have the difficult discussion. And sometimes I think the parent teams deliberately, or they struggle to have this, so they're quite happy to let ICU be the bad boys and girls making that decision. And uh, I agree with that. It would be good if the parent teams were much better at this. In fact, it would be much better if the GPs were much better at this so people didn't even get admitted to hospital if they didn't want it. And the aged care staff were doing a better job of this so they didn't even get transferred to hospital. And that's the work I'm predominantly doing these days. I'm educating, I'm running workshops for GPs and aged care staff across Australia to try and teach them that this is what really should be happening. But recognise that they do end up in hospital, recognising the parent teams don't have this discussion because they feel unskilled or uncomfortable having this discussion. We do end up being left with it. Um, what I would say is if we as intensive care doctors and nurses do become more skilled at this, at least we do a good job of it and at least we know that we look after the patients and the families in having that discussion and it's part of the extended role of intensive care staff out to looking after the deteriorating patient, managing the met calls. I, so we can't fix other people. We can encourage them, we can provide the education, we can do that. But in the meantime, as intensive care staff, at least we know we can do a better job on it ourselves. I don't know whether Charlie wants to add to that. I, I agree totally to that. Sorry, is your microphone on? Hopefully. You can hear? Yeah. Sorry, Charlie. Yep. I, I totally agree. There, there's a delusion in medicine that the longer you leave making a decision, the easier it becomes and the more reliable it is. In fact, the evidence is, the psychology evidence is, that in a crisis, you make your worst decisions. The decisions made earlier on, and you know, Kahneman is, you know, is thinking fast and slow, which we haven't read, is a great book. Um, about how people make decisions. So doing it early is good. There's also actually in advanced care planning uh, some nice data saying that if you leave it, so they, they did a, a, a study looking at housebound, frail, elderly patients, 
and discovered that they were completely incapable of doing any advanced care planning. They were hoping to live until lunchtime. Um, and so they weren't really thinking. And then the whole processes are gone. Um, the idea that you can think and plan early on and then you have some sort of thing which you can then adjust as time goes on makes it much easier. Why on earth we say we must have a completely blank slate until a crisis, at which time they're hypoxic, hypotensive, their family are in a crisis, the doctor's lost it, that's when we're going to do it. It's all upside down, it's all stupid. So, of course we want to change it all, but I agree with Bill, we cannot change the world. The fact is that there is a tsunami of elderly, frail people coming over us, at, and we need to be able to do it. And if we can't do it, we have to have the skills, because even in a utopian world, there will still be people having, <coughs> where they've fallen through the gaps. But, of course, you're right. But, of course, we have to do it. Other questions? Yep. Um, I think there is a little bit more of the dialogue now that I'm seeing sort of from an ED and ICU basis coming from the GP community, the um, nursing home community, this advanced health, correct, uh, advanced health planning. Um, but I suppose it's more about the availability of that document with a formal guardianship um, uh, sort of story behind it. Um, if that patient then presents to the ED, there's just not the availability of that. And I know that they're going into the whole um, e-health um, story. And is there a lot of sort of um, uh, move to getting that directive placed onto the e-health record so that, say, at the coalface, so when the patient's either being discussed with, say, ED first for admission or even uh, presenting to ED, is that a... Is so, there work towards yeah, that? So what, what you're really referring to is how do we get rid of this barrier of cross-boundary communication. If someone's filled out an advanced care directive with their GP and it's sitting at home in the bedside table or it's sitting in the on the fridge and someone collapses elsewhere, or if it's been done in the aged care home or if it's been done in another state, how do we make sure it's available for people in the hospital when they turn up or available to the ambulance service to know what to do? So we've been looking at that in a number of different ways. And I, my personal position is that the only way to get that to happen properly is to have it loaded up onto my health record, which is a federal government sponsored multi-million dollar thingy. I've been on the National Steering Committee for that some time, and it's now up and running, but it's gonna take a while to get, you know, like how many people in this room have got a my health record? How many people have looked at someone else's e-health record and found it helpful? Right. So, except, look, things have to start off slowly. It's a bit like uh, the, the Australian Organ Donor Registry. That started off with only a few thousand, and now we've, I think we've got 40% of the Australian population uh, now registered. It is growing, and as we continue to push it and get GPs more involved and hospitals more aware of it, then that will that will grow, but I think it's the only way because whether across different boundaries within the state or across different jurisdictions, we need to have a standard way of being able to look it up and find it. Yeah. But look, there are so many different levels that we can be working at in terms of improving this. It's all about education, it's about regulation, standards, uh, accreditation, um, it's about remuneration and so on. Charlie? Can I just destroy all of that for Bill? Um, <laughs> Most it, welcome. Um, <laughs> so in Geelong, we've had the e-health, we have our advanced care plan on our electronic record, and everyone who's got one has a pink bar on their pathology, so you can't get into their pathology without noticing a flag that they've got something. Should look at, sorry, it's a green bar for advanced care planning. Um, I'm going to ask you, for the elderly patients who are admitted to hospital and subsequently died, how long do you think it was between the time they arrived in hospital and the time that electronic record was opened? And I've got to tell you, this is a bloody sight easier than opening my record, because it's there and it's front of you and you can't get to the pathology without going past it, saying, do you want to look at it? And you say, sod off. So, you know, just to get a little guess, who thinks, uh, 
the, what, what do you think the mode is, the modal time that people look at it? One hour? Okay, put your hand up when you think I get there. One hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, 48 hours. Christ, no one looks at them. So, you know, we put it somewhere even more remote, it's going to be difficult. My answer is it isn't about this. The paper is, is, about, is great, but it's about the family knowing. The ones I like are when I go down to ED and I go and say, oh, and say I'm wondering what we should do for her. And they go, oh, she talked about this. She wouldn't want a bar of it. And we're all together and we all are going to be really upset if you do anything. We're actually quite pissed off with the emergency people for doing so much already. I like those cases. You know, it's really clear. <laughs> Um, that's what it is. It's about everyone being on the same page. How you get there, but you know, investing a ton of money in electronic connection is not going to solve it. This is about communication, and I mean, Bill will agree with me. You know, it's about the whole family and agreeing things. <laughs> and, and Charlie, I do agree with you, but I think it's uh, it's what Charlie just told us about is a brilliant, brilliant example about what we need to do about yeah. systems within health these days. Yeah is about looking at human behaviour. Yeah. And that's a perfect example of where they think they've got it all right, but human behaviour is still beating yeah. them at it. Now, there's a, a, a health service in Wisconsin, in La Crosse, where they started a program called Respecting Choices in the US, where they identified the same problem. So what did they do? They set it up so that any doctor who wanted to look up any pathology results could not look at anything and they couldn't order any tests until they had clicked on the person's advanced care plan and then acknowledged that they'd read it. And their compliance with looking at advanced care plans went up overnight from 20% to 90%, simply because they were stopped from doing the things that they normally need to do with their patients unless they complied with something. It's a bit like, you know, you've all got phones. If you want to download an app, you can't look at it until you've typed in your thing and you've clicked that you agree to iTunes or whatever it is, mm. right? Mm. You just can't get past it. Mm. So, great example where they've gone probably 80% of the way, but to do the finish, they've got to think more about human behaviour. You've got to force things. But and documentation it, isn't the solution. Don't, you can't do it in isolation. <coughs> we need more uh, communication. So and, and the documentation without the family knowing about it and without the family being on board for me, is half the job done. So these are great questions. We'll take one yeah. more question, then we'll go on because... We sorry, we've just got one over there. We've got time for you to actually do it. Um, and then we're going to go on, and then we'll, we've got plenty of time to address other questions and do other things, but please. I mean, there's one thing about um, advanced care directives being recognised in terms of them existing in the first place, but on the frontline hospital admission, acknowledging those documents seeing how situations change, like um, how does, I mean, recently we had a case where even within the same hospital, a palliative care advanced care directive had been put under the water because of a change in circumstances. Had been put under what, sorry? Put under the water, it hadn't been recognised. So All right. We had another advanced care directive and then palcare came in saying we did one nine months ago and it was in, within the same hospital, but because circumstances changed then there's like time limits put on hospital-based advanced care directives and how, like, is there a way to get around that in terms of if they have limitations of three months, six months? Yeah, Fun. look, people all get caught up about, oh, you've, you know, what, I don't trust these advanced care directives because someone might have filled it out two years ago or three years ago and is it still relevant now? Now, um, that's probably only covering half of what you're asking but let me just address that. They don't have to be set in stone. It's really an opportunity for someone to think about what they want in the future based on what they know now and what their current condition is. If their circumstances were to change, we would encourage people to update it. And secondly, while a person remains competent, what they say right now is, of course, more valid, more important than anything they've filled out in the past. But the moment they lose competency, at least we've got something written down. And we've found over the years that people's values don't change. And people's views about what they want don't, what they want don't change. And if anything, in a, a longitudinal study we did, 
we found that if in the past they put a limit on what they want, any change put further limits on it in the future, which helps to answer those people who were critical of what we're doing, saying, well, what if they say yesterday they don't want anything or want limitations, and in the future they say, now actually we want everything. It's not the way it goes, if anything goes in the other direction. So if someone's already done something in the past where they put a limit, we should at least be respecting that, and maybe if their circumstances now got worse, we should be putting further yeah. limits. Charlie, I'd you say, want to add yeah, something? I think, I mean, absolutely right. You're talking <coughs> about a treatment plan, so it's a medical treatment plan for when they come in, and my attitude to it is, so we've got this <coughs> crazy plan, at the, the crazy system at the moment. What we do is, they're bloody hard to write, getting people to do them and the process and forcing junior doctors to do them and write them, <coughs> getting them right, is a real pain. It, it, it's an agony. So what do we do when the patient comes back in the next time? We've got two choices we could do. The first one is to say, Charlie, last time you came in, this is the plan we made for you. Is, do, you do you want the same thing this time, or do you want to change it? And 90% of the time, people would say, yeah, what I did last, the plan last time is the same as this time. And that would make it quick and easy. But what we actually do is we wipe, because it's such a hard task to do, we take all the workings, everything that was done last time, off the table and start again from scratch and have another agonising thing of trying to do it. It would be much better if we took what you did last time is the default this time until you revise it, and we need to revise it. And if everyone's upset, and all those people who say things change and people change, and I'm with Bill, if you do it based on values and you do it well, they don't tend to change. Circumstances change a bit, but you don't. Um, and, and there are a couple of things to add to that. Make it much Firstly, easier. wiping the slate clean does two things. Firstly, we go and do stupid things yeah. now that we already knew previously not to do. And that first 48 hours is when all that crisis happens, of course, isn't it? Yep. And secondly, patients get really pissed, pissed. off yeah. when we keep going back and asking them the same thing yeah. and the family. They think, no. we talked about this last time, why are you putting us through the emotional trauma of having to talk about this again? We've already made a decision. So we really need to get the systems based on... <coughs> supporting what was decided previously, but we can review it. We just say, yeah. you've previously said, blah, is that how you still feel, rather than dragging them through yeah. the whole thing well, again. Same thing the advanced care plan. You find the advanced care plan, uh, sorry. You find the advanced care plan, you show it to them, say, do you still, still think this? And most, you know, 99% say, yes, I did. Yeah, yeah I do. So look, I, I know others hard. have got some good questions. It a lot of pain. We'll hold them over. Uh, I'll hand over to Charlie and then, um, Go on to the next bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do, so we, we're going to come up, and the whole idea of the morning from a, is to try and end up with you at the end of the morning with some great skills that you can take home um, in terms of talking to patients about this issue and hopefully looking at it in a different way to how you look at it at the moment. And um, so in terms of, uh, where are we? Um, so in, in terms of the whole planning process and the discussion process, the thing about do you want ventilation, do you want dialysis, is tough. It's sort of like the end answer to a process and actually understanding the process that people use to get there. Why would people go and do advanced care planning? Why would they decline treatment in hospitals? You know, what's the basis of it? And understanding the underlying values helps us to, to help people to get there. The people who know what they don't want are nurses and physiotherapists. Elderly nurses and physiotherapists know exactly what they don't want. And it's interesting, in our advanced care planning clinic, you know, it's overwhelmed by nurses and physiotherapists. Um, you know, who know, no, not, not for me under any circumstances. And again, if you look at the postcodes of the areas where people come to from advanced care planning, they're great postcodes. You know, they're good socioeconomic, tertiary educated postcodes. They worked it all out, but expecting the rest of the population to work it out, come to a conclusion and sort this out is too complicated. We know that the advanced care planning conversation takes a long time and the actual, a good facilitator takes a long time to train and it's difficult. So how are we going to generalise this? And also for thinking about what are the, what are the key things that we ought to be thinking about um, is, is important. So 
I've been thinking about values for some time, and this is the sort of uh, values that I see in the hospital all the time. Never, never, never give up, Winston Churchill. You remember, some of you remember that stork with the frog? Do you remember that, or are you too young for that? <laughs> On the fridge, is it all the items? Am I doing something wrong? There was a frog in a stork's mouth, and it's got its hands round the stork's neck, and it got round all the hot ICUs had it up, you know, about the annoying frog. He wasn't going to be swallowed. But I mean, my thing was the the frog didn't look very old. He certainly had no comorbidities, and it didn't really reflect my practice. So it's all very well to be stubborn, but you know, it gets you to bad places. So this thing, no matter what, fight on. You know, is this what everybody thinks? Is this the human default? That and, you know, we're going to do that for everybody unless they really stand up. And actually standing up in hospital is hard. Standing up against your family, standing up against the doctors, standing up against everyone and saying no is really quite hard. So as a basis of it, and a simple thing, we've got here, so the, the what matters most, trying to highlight whether living as long as possible is a priority. So in the first part, this is a little thing we use that, that, to, to the basic values. So maintaining dignity, and if you can't see it up there, it's vitally important, somewhat important, neutral, of little importance, not at all important. Dignity, avoiding pain and suffering, living as long as possible, remaining independent. So we let people rate those. And of course, if you want to, you can make them all vitally important if you're that sort of person. All right? And then underneath, we put another second thing. Circle the goal that you'd like your doctor to make the number one priority when treating you. So we force them then. They've got to pick one. They can't do all of them. So what do you reckon? Given fight on, never say die, never, 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 never. So is, is living as long as possible going to be the biggest priority? That's what you do, guys. Come on. That's your job. Never say die, never stop, whatever it takes, keep going. So if we're going to use this as a default, so what, what, what's underneath people's thought processes? Let's have a look. So dignity, very important. Avoiding pain and suffering, very important. Remaining independent, quite important. Living as long as possible, something weird. Neutral is the mode. So if we're only ever saying, so you know, unless we treat you, you'll die, is not the conversation. We've got some interesting stuff around dignity, and independence, I mean, I'm interested in independence, particularly elderly ladies who live on their own. I'm not going anywhere else. No one's wiping my bottom. Um, you know, stay in the nursing, stay in the nursing home. Stay in my unit as long as possible. Um, avoid uh, pain and suffering. But then the dignity and what's dignity? What's indignity for you? So there's a whole load of rich stuff to talk to people about, and it's not living for bloody ever, is it? Okay. So what about the doctor? So is this a lie now? We have all this, but we're going to tell our doctor something else. We have all this stuff, but when we're talking to doctors, we'll say live as long as possible. Do you reckon? Mm, no. So, so again, exactly the same. So in terms of talking to the doctor, you know, there's a whole load of deep stuff beyond living as long as possible that people want to share with their doctor. And it's not, hard, it's not far under the surface. There's a thin layer of skin on the top, and underneath there's all this rich stuff. So um, avoiding pain and suffering. What would be unacceptable pain and suffering for you? What would be uh, undignified for you? What level of independence? How long are you prepared to, to uh, trade your independence? And are you prepared to go out not independent? Because I think you're going to. All right? So lots to talk about. And when we're thinking about people, and Bill talked before about values and how people think and about people, there are, I mean, there are things about you and there are things about the stage of life that you're in that I think say a lot. And when I'm looking at someone, I'm trying to work this stuff out. And this is stuff I put together from all of the different papers that have ever been talked about values, um, the ones I liked anyway. Um, so attitude to life, completed life ready to go versus uncompleted life, lots left to, left to do. You can see the young mum with the kids, you know, has got to stay. The old lady who says, I'm waiting for God to take me. You've seen them both. Um, death is inevitable or natural or death is avoidable and if you don't avoid it, you know, it's your fault. Um, 
and burden of disease, intolerant of disease and suffering, willing to accept disability and suffering, whatever's necessary as long as I'm alive. You know, those people who say, you say, this must be awful for you, and say, well, the alternative's worse. You've seen them. Um, the burden of treatment, concerned about prolonged treatment, are reassured about the availability of treatment. Medical science has limits, we all die. Anything can be cured, providing you try enough and you're bright enough and you're dedicated enough. Quality is essential, being alive is the most important. There's no point talking to these being alive people about quality. Um, and there's no point about talking to the quality people about living a bit longer. Um, they're very different. Going on too long is undignified. Dignity is enhanced by struggle. Struggle's good, struggle's bad. Suffering's good, suffering's bad. So I can put people in these. And interestingly, when you start doing this, you actually find quite quickly that people fall into one category or the other quite nicely. There's a few little funny things. And funny, people have odd things like the family, you know, my requirement to stay, to look after my wife and stuff like that because she needs looking after and therefore I can't make an autonomous decision and I sort of veer away from it. But overall, this gives you quite a lot of information about the person. And interestingly, this doesn't change. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm interested, you know, my, my dad had political views all his life and God, he died with them. Just the same, he never changed. Um, you know, I vote and I generally vote the same thing. I can't, I try and sort of let the, you know, pretend that I could be swayed, but I can't get swayed. You know, that, you're the same. It's a, we're, we're, that's how we are. And when you meet someone 20 years after you're at uni, they're not that different. When they were annoying at uni, they're annoying now. <laughs> you know, it's the same. So we, we, I think we stick the same. So, and and uh, uh, some years ago, uh, uh, Osler, who's a great physician, he said it's more important to know what sort of person the disease has than what sort of disease the person has. And it's one of the things I've carried through my medical career because it is very important. And it's saying, who is this? Who's this one? Tell me about your mum. So in order to sort of capture this and make it efficient, um, because there's so many things, we'd use my values. Um, so I put all these values in. And the other thing that's really interesting that I find in this whole business is, what do you want? You are someone. And we have, as human beings, we're interesting that we can have two views at the same time. Would you like to pay more tax? No. Would you like more services? Yes. OK, inconsistent. We've got to work it out. I've got to push you a bit to work it out. You know, do, you want, you know, do you want to persecute refugees? Do you want to let everybody in? You know, it doesn't take long to get all, all over the place. So the idea that lawyers have, that people have this plan that is fixed and absolutely like that, it's not. It's all over the place. So what we've got to try and do is to try and see for you which are the bits that aren't all over the place that I can rely on and are likely to stay the same over a period of time. And that's the challenge. So I did this in conjunction with the University of uh, Technology in Sydney, who have a centre for the study of choice. And they're talking about how humans make choice. And we're not computers. We're not binary computers. We're sort of wussy, woolly, all over the place stuff. And uh, recognising that will help us to get better plans. So this My Values uh, site, which I'll give you the address for in, at the end, um, it allows you to do the, the, the thing. And because it looks really lovely and quite spiffy, everyone thought that it was you know, going to cost them money. So we had to do this. Not for profit, free to use, and done by the Victorian Department of Health. It looks better than a, you know, gov than a... It looks like a commercial site, not a government one. So that was a worry for some people. So here it is. So the things help me speak for my family about touchy issues. Um, and then here, so here's the first question. I'm concerned that medical treatment for me will not be taken far enough. So general big picture things that then we can construct down, and I'll tell you what we've been doing with this later, to take it into actual decision making. So here's, uh, you know, pick the box at the bottom, strongly agree. This works on iPhones and on iPads and on computers. Um, I'd rather be, and, and then I, don't, I don't want to know that you don't want to go into a nursing home. I want to know you'd rather die. Because no one wants to go into a nursing home. It doesn't actually answer the question. So let's cut to the chase. Death. All right? Uh, so when I do, so you see that I don't want. Hmm? I was just saying you can see why I love doing work <laughs> with Charlie. And so then you get the answers. Here's the answers down. Here's mine. Nothing. And, and it then generates a report, and there's an opportunity on the report to say whether you agree with it. It was interesting to see how many people actually sort of feel comfortable that what's come out of the report is right. So the report only generates the areas, I told you before, in the mush of stuff that you think, I'm trying to get the bits where there's consistency and there's something I can f step on that will not 
you know, disappear uh, under the water. That there's fixed, the fixed stepping stones. So I sign it, and, uh, and then having signed it, I send it to my family and share it with my family. So there's the family that I've shared it with, and those little ticks mean that the other person has said they respect it. So they automatically come back and said they respect it. This bottom daughter here with the clock on is the daughter who never gets organized and does anything. <laughs> and she is not my enduring power of attorney. She's lovely, but she's not, you know, she's not going to get round to it. <laughs> so that tells me something. But the rest of the family are locked in. You know, they're all locked in. So interesting the question. So now have a look at this. So it's important for me to keep fighting for life and to battle on in the face of suffering. So we've got a few things there. We've got fighting, battle. So it's the battle suffering, you know, the battle, you know, everyone has a battle, you know, don't they, with their cancer and everything. It's got to be a battle. So we've got a couple of those words in. And we've got a bit of suffering. So battle, battle fighting and suffering. Um, so agree, strongly agree, 18%. So we started, you know, with one question, we started to get, we got 18% of toughies there, but we'll see how they sort of hold up as they go through. <laughs> it's important to live as long as possible and to fight every step of the way. So it's a different sort of thing. We haven't got the battle in there, and we haven't got any suffering in there this time. So we jack it up, oh, no, actually we don't, 14%. And they're not quite the same 14%, which is interesting. There's a bit of flippy flop. But we can work it through. Um, and, uh, but, you know, say so strongly disagree and disagree for 75%. There's a lot of ambiguity about all this toughness out there. Toughness is great for other people, but not for me, really, okay? So medical treatment has its limits. Keeping going too long is not appropriate, and the odds of a good outcome are small. 3%. All right? I'm sorry, but that tough thing at the beginning, you know, whatever it takes is a delusional thing that we live with. Where there's funny schizophrenia in people. And uh, the whole advanced care planning and, and good decision making at the end of life is based on, on, on you know, a delusion. Oh, sorry, the good stuff is based on fact. The, the, the actual default is a delusion. I'd rather be dead than have to go into a nursing home long term. So 21% want to go to a nursing home. And again, you know, if they're the toughy fight, fight, fight people, and I, can say, and I can tell you overall, overall it comes out to about 7% incredibly tough. Which leaves 93% that the default that we do is not right. And I, I struggle with the toughies because I never know when to stop. Because I actually do what they ask me, but I feel very bad about it. And I think we all do, and we just got no idea. I know, toughies don't leave any permission to anyone to ever make a step back. And I say to them, are you sure that you don't want to do this? There's no line in the sand at all, nothing. You really trust that I can't do really bad things to you? And I talk about hope with a safety net. Hope needs a safety net. If you don't have a safety net under hope, it can take you somewhere bad. And I like this one. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, have you ever heard this around the kitchen? So, look, why don't we have a bit of that Christmas dinner conversation stuff into our medical system? Because it's there. Why is there this complete separation? The chatting at home and the delusional behavior in the hospital. Why can't we bring it together and get something? So here, um, you know, I like them because they're nice, uh, uh, you know, um, metaphors for what I'd like my family to do is to let me off quickly and make a decision that actually helps that process. Don't stand by doing nothing. Actually help to get it over and done with, which is what my dad said, what my granny said, what my auntie said, what most people say. So what do we got here? So we've got, to, but it does actually sort of flush people out if you're a bit uncomfy about it. So we've got this 25% disagree, 7% strongly disagree. But you know, I'm over, I'm over Brexit here with, um, <laughs> with, with, with the agree side. But you know, so again, we're getting a feature. If someone's picking all these things, you're getting a feel about them. That's probably means something. More so than saying, do you want dialysis? I mean, I, I don't know, Christ. But this, this gives me something. I say, who is that person in the bed? I'm getting a good feel about it, who it is. And, and this perhaps will give good permission to someone to make decisions. And there's an incredibly cheap way to get the card into, the, uh, into your wallet. We, we just print this out, cut it out with a print, cut out with scissors, fold, put in wallet. <laughs> uh, no cost at all. And there it is. And that, that links a doctor to, to it, so you can see it. So you haven't got it on Bill's, uh, you know, my, the, the MyGov thing, and the thing, it's in your wallet. One cent. 
Uh, and there's the, the little bit of the promotional stuff for it. And we now, I mean, what's interesting now, I've got uh, 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 several thousand people have done it, and it's growing all the time. The lawyers have got on it, so when they're getting the people to do, because uh, I, get, I get frustrated by the lawyers doing, uh, appointing enduring powers of attorney and not even telling the enduring power of attorney that they've done it to them. And, and say, you know, so, you know, we've appointed Mavis, but you don't go and tell her. Or if you go and tell Mavis you've appointed her, but don't tell her any, don't give her any helpful information to make the decision. And so the legal ones I find enormous struggle with because they come in and they say, I've been appointed. And you say, okay, what are you going to do? And they haven't got a clue. Um, so that we do, they're using this to help to, uh, to the, the family to tell the uh, appointed people what to do. And so we've got tons of data, which is what I really ever wanted out of this, um, apart from doing good, um, to, that we can analyze. And we're in the process of doing that. And you've just seen some of the things for it. So this is the... Yeah, it's free, so it's sponsored exactly with 100% of our income is sponsoring this session. Um, no, I'm excited by it. It's, it's, it's good, it's interesting, it's fun. And it, uh, I think, reconstructs the way we think. So, this, but, so there it is, write it down. Please do it. Please get your parents to do it. Um, everyone should do it, because, uh, you know, who in here today, if you have a, uh, a basal, uh, you know, basilar artery thrombosis and are locked in, I'm presuming that you all want a trachea and a peg tube in a nursing home. <laughs> so and I, who's, who's got an advanced care plan? So the rest of you are all going to the nursing home with the trachea and the te peg tube, OK? So if you don't want that, why don't you do one? And then and it's good. And the other thing as a health professional, if you've done one, do one of these and say you've done one. And, um, and then you can tell your patients you've done one. So it's not about you're dying, so you need to do it. So this whole decision about end of life thing, right at the very end, you must, you must, you've got to make choices and do stuff. But I don't, because I'm in the happy livy bit. Um, no, we're all, I've got bad news for you, we're all going to die. So, and some of us will be unlucky and bad stuff will happen very early. And the earlier it happens, the better it is that you've done one of these. So that chap came out from Cambridge, um, and was talking about the, the, the minimally aware people and this girl who, uh, did, were you there last, last uh, year? The, 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 he came out and he's talking about minimally aware and this girl who'd written a whole load of poetry and pictures about her life and being a free bird and all the stuff had a terrible stroke and is now locked in. And the, the doctors won't stop and the, they won't stop because she hasn't got a, what they called a formal advice. Her pictures weren't enough. Um, so... Well, it's a shame. Well, I think it's a shame. So there we go. And if you, don't, if you can't remember it, you didn't write it down, if you put my values into Google, it comes up number one. So, so, so the thing about it is, what I want you to take out of this, apart from writing it down and doing it, is these value stuff. You know, dignity, suffering, you know, uh, indignity. You know, what it's, what's it all about? It's just under the surface. You only have to talk to anybody... And it's there. There's only 7% of people who are blindly trusting and focused and will, do, will suffer anything for it. The rest don't have that. And you only have to ask two or three questions to realise that they're in the toughy group. Actually, you normally just have to walk in the room and look at them, and you've got it. Charlie, can we okay. just ask the audience yeah. a question for a moment? Hands up who's got uh, house insurance. <clears throat> right. Now, keep your hand up if you believe your house is going to burn down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we already know how many people have got an advanced care plan. Now, and Do you believe you're I, going to die? I haven't, always kept up, <laughs> I haven't always kept up with the medical literature, but as far as I'm aware, the mortality rate for human beings is still pretty close to 100%. So it's... Uh, I just endorse what Charlie's saying. It's just crazy we're not, we don't all have advanced care plans. And Many of us have wills, but yeah. even then you have to confront your own mortality when you do one of those. And that's about what happens after you're gone. And I like to use the word when as well, when something bad happens to you, not if. Are you pretending if you think it won't? I mean, it's going to happen. You, you know, bad stuff has to happen between now and being dead. There's a bit. And it may not be very long, but there's a bit. You know, when that happens, what shall we do? And when you say when, it makes it a much more... And if they look funny at you, you can say, well, you know, it's going to happen to all of us. You know, those bills are 100%. So, you know, the, the when thing is much better. If, so if something happens, is so unlikely that you're not doing about it. When is something you should do something about. Yeah. So 
So we've got these values, and I want you to think about these things when we, when we go move into the bit uh, that we're going to do later on, which is about you having a discussion with someone who's quite sick to try and get some words and skills, which again is not really complicated. We're going to give you some very nice little tools that allow you to have the conversation in a way that they think you're lovely. So, Bill, where are we going next? Yep. Pat, are we starting with that, or are we? Yeah, why don't we do that? And then we'll go on to the... Um, how, how, how long are we away from coffee? That's an important question for this session. Half an hour. Half an hour. So, so we could set Pat. it up and begin. Pat, we'll start and do Pat. We might do half Pat and come back with it. Okay, so what we're going to do... Um, can I get this word thing up on here? Clearly I can't, but that's the right to ask <laughs> to have it up. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If you look at people who have completed Yes. What's the age spectrum? Uh, the, the mode is around 60. The yeah, what age? So the question was, what age are they? And the, so the mode is around 60, which is you know, like the compu computer literate, just beginning to think about retirement, still, still well enough not to have any of this stuff really on top of you and be terrified about it. So just about the right age. And I mean, for me, that's the right age. Everybody around, you know, I mean, I want you all to do it, but everybody around, you know, at around 60, it's really sensible. Around 70, it's desperate. Around 80, it's insane that you haven't done it. Yeah. I think it'd be very good. If, if, yeah. Well, it's going to be permission. Somebody may have to think about stopping it, maybe your parents, and giving them permission to stop is a huge task. Pediatric so permission hospitals. to stop, yeah. permission to stop for relatives is a huge part of this whole thing. It's about giving them permission not to do it. They know it's insane, but you have to give them permission. And the other side, the family need to give mum permission to go, and I find it very difficult when they're you know, begging mum not to go. And you've seen this. You know, old, old lady comes into the emergency department, some catastrophic awfulness in her abdomen, um, terrible comorbidities. You say you know, about surgery, and she says, no, love, no, that would be stupid, and you agree. And then the family arrive, and you sure as eggs, unless you can supervise the family and keep them from beating her to death, um, she will change her mind half an hour later and have the operation. You say, why? You told me, you want, and they say, well, I'm doing it for my family. And they are. So the family haven't given her permission to go. So this permission stuff is terribly important. And advanced care planning is a lot about permission, in my mind. But you asked about kids. So Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne are mm. getting much more involved in advanced care planning now. It's no different. It's just... It's no different. Emotionally, it may seem to be harder, but it's no different. And they're seeing that there's a lot of value in that, and particularly mm. around this whole area yeah. of shared decision-making. Yeah. Just because someone's 16 or 15 or 14 doesn't mean that they can't make a contribution. Doesn't mean that they don't still have their own views on what they do and don't Can want. We just need to give and let the picture them come up onto the and their families if you just do and the health professionals the, involved the spaces. permission the to be able to talk about this so that we honour what they believe, and so they can participate in a decision that's being made. Has any work been done looking at um, whether substitute decision makers get it right if asked blindly? So I, without seeing the My Values page, and you go and ask your substitute decision maker, what do you think mum would want, and then go and ask mum what she wanted, do they get it right? Could I, I can, you answer it, first, no, and I'll answer ahead. second. Sometimes they do. However, there are lots of papers that say how poor substitute decision makers do. But they don't ask the question that I ask. So whenever we've made a decision, we often, and we often make decisions with a substitute decision maker to treat somebody, and then we treat them, and then I, because the ones that we decide not to treat obviously die, so I can't ask them. But the ones that we treat, I say to them always at the end, in order to, you know, for quality assurance, what do you think of the decision? Did we make the right decision? What do you think they say? So there's three things that they say. Yes, you did. No, you didn't. You, you, you're all bastards. Or, I don't know, it's bloody hard, and I forgive you for making the decision. I could never have made it, and the one you made is 
reasonable under the circumstances. How do you think those three cut, cut out? The last one, yeah, I could never make the decision. It's incredibly difficult. There's no right answer. I'm all right with it. And then they may veer towards, but please don't do it again, or uh, <laughs> happy. And more of them veer to, please don't do it again, than I'm, it's a miracle and I was all wrong. Very few in my experience are like that. But the point is, it's about, you know, going to the bar and buying your partner a drink. You know, you get them, you know, think, what do they have? And you guess, and you take it back. And they rarely say, you, you know, you should have got the other one. They drink it, don't they? So it's the same. <laughs> so the question is, it's not about right or wrong. You know, I can't get my wife, I can't get it right for my wife, but she forgives me. Sorry, can we just get the microphone to him, please? Thanks. I'm a goals of care advocate here in Perth, and I've, I've, in fact, I've referenced a lot of your My Values um, stuff in some of the presentations that I've done. One of the criticisms that I've, I've received, however, is, and I'm sure you'll be able to inform me, the people who go to this website, are they a self-selected group of, of people? Of course. And is the data representative of society? I would like to think it is, but what do you say to those people who ask that question? Well, we have forced some people to do it in order to not, uh, so that they're not self-selected. We did it with our, um, so we have done small groups of people where we've got them to, we've made them do it, and the, the results are very similar. That's all I can say. I don't think these are a weird subset. I think they represent humanity. And I mean, the way that I presented it, you know, with the thing about the jumping off the, you know, throwing me off a cliff stuff and all the rest, you know, you're not all going, that's mad. No, nobody in their right mind, you know, you send them to a psychiatrist if anyone thought that. You're not doing that. None of my family do that. I mean, they, you know, my family have all done it. Um, I suppose they may not have been voluntary. Um, and, they, and they come up with the same stuff. So I think it's right, but we do need probably to pay and get a couple of hundred to do it paid and then see what the, how that compares. And interesting, the ones who've actually done in our advanced care planning and done it are exactly the same as the normal population have done it. So we're not, I think that says the other way, that the people coming to the advanced care planning clinic aren't really weird. They're not weird, you know, pro-euthanasia lunatics. They're actually normal people. Uh, coming back to the last question about substitute decision makers, there's not much evidence in clinical practice, but in research practice, there's evidence that about half the time they actually make a different decision from which a patient would make, and that they are clear that they don't want to be involved in the time-sensitive manner that we need them to be involved. So really, uh, the evidence we have suggests that they're not really very good at no. doing the role that they're being asked to do, partly because it's an extremely hard role for the point you made earlier, which is you're saying to them, let me be clear, what you think about this is the second most important thing to me. Yeah. What your loved yeah. one thinks is actually truly the only important thing. To be. And often the loved one hasn't told them what they think. So right. it makes no it one, hard. No one talks about this over yeah. Sunday lunch yeah. uh, is, the, is the truth of it. Can I just add, that's true in the past, but if we look at what's happened with organ donation here in Australia, if we had an organ donation discussion 15 years ago, it was usually because we'd all just read in the paper about what happened to David Hooks in Adelaide when he <coughs> got hit by someone, fell over, cracked his head and ended up being brain dead at hospital and became an organ donor. And I remember with one particular family I was talking about, they said, you know, because I was talking to them about, can we, uh, can we talk about organ donation for your son? And they said it, he was only talking about it a month ago uh -huh. over the David Hooks thing. In the past, when we brought up organ donation in intensive care, it was often faced with families saying, don't know, we never talked about it. More often than not now, families are actually bringing it up themselves in the ICU when we're dealing with a, a patient with a critical illness. I'm sure many of you have seen this. So that's a change that's occurred in 10 years. The more we talk about this, the more we get it out there as a part of public debate, then the more it will be discussed over a Sunday lunch and the more we will actually know what people want. Bill, we I'm thinking what we this? should do, what we might do is to set up this thing, work it all out, what we're going to do, and then have a coffee and then come back and hit it. So what we're going to do is speed dating, all right? <laughs> so that you have little short things and then we'll move around and you're going to be Pat or you're going to be the doctor or nurse talking to Pat. So Pat is a 78-year-old patient who has uh, serious pulmonary fibrosis 
The disease has re relentlessly progressed over the last five years despite best available treatments. There's no question that Pat's been treated as well as Pat could be treated. Now needs continuous oxygen. The, the breath is significantly limits movement and leads to being chair bound. Coughing fits are frequent and frightening. And Pat's had two hospital admissions in the last six months, one of which involved an ICU admission and a week of intubation. That's, that's the fine slice CT. So generally, we, what we need to do before we have a talk to anyone is think about what we think. So what's Pat's prognosis? So prognosis is no, it's thinking about the future. It's not just about a, a time. It says nothing about clocks or calendars. It's, a, it's about thinking about the future. What is in Pat's future? So if you're talking about Pat about prognosis, time you could talk about, but it's going to be difficult. We're not very good at talking about time because we worry that we'll get it wrong, but we'll give you some clues to how to do that in a minute. But what else is Pat? What else does Pat's future hold apart from limited time? Deterioration, distressing, distressing death. So, that, so what's Pat going to be most worried about? That Pat isn't going to live for a long time or that Pat's death is going to be shitty? So it's much more like... So in prognosis, we want to talk about that, the future. Um, so acute events are likely to provoke a crisis. Um, so respiratory failure, more likely than a stroke, more likely than a urinary retention. Yeah, I'm like very high. So actually predicting things. So when we talk about acute advanced care planning, I quite like to think about the clinicians thinking about advanced planning, about what's going to happen to someone, and actually planning for it. Why is advanced care planning the patient's responsibility? Couldn't doctors plan in advance and reassure people about bad stuff that they worry about? Um, so what will Pat, we've, so Pat's going to be worrying about that. So let's just move... Oh, Sorry, can you move it up from there or do you have to come up here? Sorry. Oh, if we can move it up. So then we'll talk about Pat. So in order just to help you when you're Pat, I'll give you a clue to how Pat's thinking. So you're very, very limited by your lung disease. You know it's going to get you. You feel very scared when your coughing stops you from getting your breath and you feel like you might die. And you're right, of course. Um, this is happening increasingly frequently. You're depressed, anxious, and fearful, but depressed, you know, realistically depressed at this stage of, of illness. Uh, you can't do the things you could do. You know that the future's bad, you want to get it over with the least badness. You reflect that your life is uh, on your life, and you think of the quote from Winnie the Pooh, sometimes I sit and think, and sometimes I just sit. A bit sad. You have no ACP, of course, because it's the real world. No doctors previously discussed your end-of-life preferences with you because it's the real world. <laughs> you can't remember anything about ICU, but you're scared to end up dependent on machines. And, but more so, what's the point? You know, what's the point? What's it going to do for me? Um, you, and you, you don't want to be worse than you are now. Uh, to, being totally dependent on others to toilet you and clean you up and wipe up your bottom is unacceptable to you, as it is to many people. The bottom wiping thing is bad. All right, it's actually a big, big thing. Interestingly, a bit more for women than men, um, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so you appreciate honesty, and any plan will avoid making your end more drawn out and unpleasant than necessary. So you're pretty open to things. And this is, I mean, is this weird? Is Pat weird, or is Pat normal? Totally normal. So there's this scared person in there on the machine just running along, on the hospital's process just running along. Um, so what, I would, what we're going to do is I want you to be... One of you, in, in pairs, to be one of you Pat and one of you the doctor or nurse. You can presume that Pat has said, what's, what's ahead of me? Just giving you some cue to get going. And then the three-step process that I suggest. Firstly, explaining prognosis. Pat, you know, this thing about alignment of reality, of the medical reality, is important. If people don't understand that they're really sick, you don't know about Pat yet, you know, if, if you're the doctor or nurse, um, I, when I'm talking about prognosis, share my worry. All right? My wife worries about me when I go out. It doesn't actually stop me going out. 
Um, but it's nice that she worries. And when the thing that she worries about doesn't happen, I don't go back and say it never happened. It's nice. Worry's nice. And it's terribly empowering to you that you can share a whole load of stuff if you're worried about things. You're just sharing. And it means that the person can reject it. No one, when you say, I'm worried about that you're going to come back to hospital, when they say, well, I didn't come back to hospital in the next three months, you were wrong. When you're worried about it, when you say, you will die in the next three months with prognosis, which is what everybody does, everyone that doesn't know how to do it does, then people come back and say, I'm still alive in six months. Look at me. You, you've had it. It's awful. But I'm worried that you're going to get into big trouble over the next few months is fine. So worry is a fantastic word. Use worry. Then listen to the patient's perspective, fears, hopes, and worries. And if, I mean, I say here, refer to an ACP if there is one, because it's a great way to open that conversation. If it's in there, you can say, this is what you said, you still think it. It just makes it much faster. But they haven't got one here. Um, and in particular, I want to know what they don't want. The fact that they want Duran Duran playing when they die or looking out of the garden at roses isn't helping us in our decision making. You know, things, what they don't want is, there's a great picture of a woman saying, you know, I'm, I'm never quite sure what I want, but I really know what I don't want. And I think that's true of everybody. So not what they don't want is to try and get across to what they don't want. And then work together to formulate relate about what shall we do? How will we deal with this? Not about me telling you or, or the patient on their own making a choice off a Chinese menu. It's about how we'll do it, so the we word is good. And then the wondering if I'm... So you throw up a suggestion. I'm wondering if going to ICU is a good idea. You know, or, or is a bad idea, given everything. I wonder if we should just keep here and actually... What if we made you really comfortable and I made sure that whenever that... The next thing, I'll write a plan in the notes, I'll write and I'll write the drugs up and they'll and ensure that you get them. How does that sound? And if they say, oh, that sounds a bit depressing, I'd really like to go to ICU, then you haven't, you haven't by wondering, so the worry and wonder, they're the two words you're going to go off with. And um, I'm not, I'm, I can't claim um, thing. Bill got a great guy out from Onca Talk and Tough Talk from the US some years ago who came out and said they had money in the US to do this program for oncologists and they worked out all of this stuff, and he taught me these things. And since the, it's one of the things that I, you know, you go to these things, and occasionally you get something really fantastic. And I went to this thing, and he gave me these words. And ever since then, I've used these words all the time, and they're magic words. They just make it work. So worry and wonder. So what we're going to do now is uh, all break into pairs. One of you is going to be Pat or Pam. And the other well, one's the can clinician. Pat, Pat can be a girl's name as well. See, that's okay, fair enough. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> one of you is going to be Pat and one of you is going to be the clinician. You're going to do this for five minutes. We'll then stop you. You'll do two minutes debriefing to each other. What did you feel like as the patient? What did you feel like or how did you find as the clinician? And then swap over five minutes and then again two minutes debrief. And then that'll give us a couple of minutes to all come back together and then we'll stop for morning tea and then start again after that. So, work out who's going to be Pat, who's going to be the clinician. Start from now and we'll stop you in five minutes to swap over. So, so just work out through the room. Who, and then do a ping to do start, your, Bill. Do your pairs. Right. Right. You're going to do a ping to start them off once they've done their pairs. Yeah. So just get in pairs and introduce. Oh, they've started. Just do it. Off you go. Good. Happy?